Good morning. We're going to read Psalm 46 today. So if you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and find your way to Psalm 46 as we continue our Closer Than You Think sermon series on the nearness of God. Psalm 46. And while you're finding that, I was eight years old when the movie Jaws was released in theaters in the summer of 1975. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that while I had never seen an ocean or a sea at that point in my life, I didn't care if I ever put my toe in a body of water bigger than the Tennessee River. We lived on the Tennessee River, you know, Savannah. But, uh, but I, I have to tell you, I wasn't too hip on putting my feet in the Tennessee River. In fact, the Jaws movie franchise gave millions of Americans a fear of getting in waters where a shark could be present. Not that a shark is seen, but just the possibility of a shark. People took the tagline of the movie seriously. You'll never go in the water again. (laughs) And the tagline of Jaws 2 didn't help matters much. Just when you thought it was safe to get back in the water. My favorite, though, is the tagline from the fourth Jaws movie called Jaws the Revenge. It was in 1987. I was in college. It was all funny at this point. In the final movie of the Jaws franchise, presumably a family member or a friend or a protege or a shark fraternity brother, who knows, of the sharks that were killed in the previous movies comes back for revenge. And the tagline says, this time, It's personal. (laughs) But did you know, did you know that on average, only about one person a year, actually less than one person a year, only about one person a year actually dies in the United States from shark attacks? We're more likely to die from a trampoline or a roller coaster or a vending machine, or a riding lawnmower, or fireworks, or dogs, or deer, or jellyfish, or falling coconuts than we are a shark bite. (laughs) Did you know the 450 Americans die each year falling out of bed? Even our beds are more dangerous and deadly than sharks. Here's where I'm going with this nonsense. Many of us allow fear, no matter how irrational it may be, many of us allow fear to shape our lives. And it is rarely for the better. I've witnessed it time and again as a pastor. Many people fear loneliness, and so they get married. But they soon discover, because they married out uh, out of loneliness instead of for love, they, they soon discover that there are worse things than being alone. Many people fear running out of money, and so they devote themselves, completely devote themselves to careers and corporate ladders to fill bank accounts, even if it costs them their marriages and their families. Many Christians live divided Christian lives because of fear. On one hand, they have their spiritual lives, their church lives, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. We've got our, our church life, and then we have the rest of our lives. And, and that might encompass you know, everything political or everything cultural or so on. And because fear-mongering has become America's favorite pastime. Many Christians have a great disconnect between what they say they believe, that God is sovereign and powerful and faithful and trustworthy, between what they say they believe and how they behave, making them functional atheists, acting as if God doesn't exist at all. I know, we don't want to admit to any of this, But that doesn't change the fact that many of us allow fear to shape our lives, even our Christian lives. But we'll see how irrational those fears are when we submit them to the truth of God's word. 
Let's read Psalm 46, beginning in verse one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving. Some of your translations say be still at this point. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Let's talk for a few moments today about God being present in our present. Present in our present. Life is filled with uncertainties. Trials and troubles are everywhere. But God promises us who trust in him that he is present in our present. He is near. He doesn't simply promise that he will be with us at some vague, distant point in the future. He promises his nearness to us. He is present in our present. And we find comfort, even in times of confusion and change, because God is closer than you think. He is present in our present. Two times the psalmist writes, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Verses 7 and 11. What he was for them then, he is for us now. Present in our present. Now we believe the inspiration for this song, Psalm 46, the story behind the song, was when Sennacherib, the powerful Assyrian king, invaded the kingdom of Judah during the reign of King Hezekiah. You can read the accounts in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, and Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. All of those are virtually identical, not, not exactly, especially with 2 Chronicles 32, but, but they're all very similar. They, they tell the same story. But the story goes something like this. Sennacherib had already conquered many nations and he thought Judah would be one more among the many nations that he had conquered. And so he sent his officials, he sent his top military men to Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, in order to solicit their surrender. And these military men came speaking the language that everyone could understand, Hebrew. Hezekiah's men said, hey, could, could, could we talk in Aramaic? And they said, no, we're going to speak so everybody can hear. And they were taunting the people of Jerusalem and, and telling them that Hezekiah was deceiving them and he was going to lead them to death and they needed to forsake Hezekiah, forsake whatever he had told them about the Lord will deliver you and come over to Sennacherib and trust in Sennacherib to, to take care of them. But Hezekiah had warned the people, do not answer, do not respond. And, uh, and yet they continued to talk. In fact, at one point, the, the military leaders from Sennacherib actually said, the Lord, they actually said, Yahweh has sent us here to conquer you. I mean, they, they took the name of the Lord in vain and lied in, in their taunt of, a taunting of the people of Jerusalem. But the Assyrian officials 
In essence, they were just trying to intimidate the people of Jerusalem so that they would surrender without a fight. I mean, that would be the easy way, right? But Hezekiah, meanwhile, sent messengers to the prophet Isaiah while he, Hezekiah, went to the temple to pray. And so Hezekiah is praying directly to the Lord. The messengers are talking to Isaiah and asking Isaiah, has the Lord given a word? Has the Lord spoken anything about this? Does the Lord have a word for us in this? And, and the word that God gave through his prophet was something like this. Don't be afraid of Sennacherib. I will take care of him and his armies. So don't worry about him. And long story short, an angel of God killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. We're not told how he did it, but Sennacherib was forced to retreat and to return to his own land where he was eventually assassinated by two of his sons. Sennacherib threatened the people and king of Judah, but they put their trust in the Lord. And the Lord proved himself a very present help in trouble. And we believe that lesson of God's presence and God's power set against overwhelming human circumstances. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of skilled and seasoned warriors within striking distance, overwhelming circumstances. But we we believe that God's faithfulness in Judah's hour of need is the basis for Psalm 46. And just as God was a very present help in trouble for his people then, he's present in our present now. And because he is present in our present, we have no reason to allow fear to shape our hearts and our minds. That's the psalmist's therefore in verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear. We will not fear. Can we say that? Are we able to say that from our hearts and mean it? Could God hear us say those words and know that we are speaking the truth? Can we say those words? We will not fear. Or do we look out at the political landscape of America or grapple with the cultural shifts that threaten the very soul of our nation and fear what is to come? And yet the psalmist says, therefore, we will not fear. Oh, pastor, I can't help it. That's just the way I am. I, I just can't help it. I worry or, 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 or I fear or, or we'll spiritualize things or, you know, we'll, 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 we'll you know, kind of try to justify our behavior and talk about we're protecting. The, what, what, when in reality, we're just afraid. And fear is shaping our minds, our hearts, our actions. Well, pastor, I just can't help it. Yes, you can. If you are a child of God and the Holy Spirit of God lives within you, yes, you can. And here's how. Number one, trust God above all else. Trust God above all else. That's what the people of Jerusalem and Judah did in the days of Hezekiah against Sennacherib. Trust God above all else. The psalmist wrote in the first verse, God is our refuge and strength. That word refuge has to do with trust. Now it's a different word than the words that are used in verses seven, or the word that is used in verses seven and 11. Those words translated as refuge in some of your translations and other translations translated as fortress or stronghold. That's a word that speaks of a lofty, inaccessible place. It's a refuge because it's inaccessible. You say, well, how, how, how does anybody get up there? Well, you see, if the enemy is ascending to trying to, to penetrate this inaccessible, lofty place of refuge, then, 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 then the enemy is, is going to be attacked. Rocks dropped on their head or arrows shot down at them. It, it is such a lofty place, so inaccessible to the enemy that, 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 that it is secure. 
That is the security. But the word refuge in verse one is a different word and it means a place of trust. We're secure because God is trustworthy. We're safe because God is our strength. So trust God above all else. I know this sounds obvious, right? But this is an important point because we are all tempted to trust in lesser things, in part because they don't require faith. Lesser things, we can see them. Lesser things, we can touch them. Lesser things, we can count them. Lesser things, we think we can control them. But either way, no faith is required. And yet Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us that we can't even please God without faith. The Christian life is a life of faith. Some people trust in politics and politicians. Some trust in armies and guns. Others trust in Wall Street and 401ks, but those are all lesser things. If we want to be delivered from fear and fear mongers, trust God above all else. He alone is our refuge and strength. God is our refuge and strength. Number two, don't let circumstances distract you from trusting God above all else. Look back at verses two and three. Therefore, we will not fear. Boy, I love that. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. What does all that mean? We have to read between the lines and beneath the surface to really understand what the psalmist is saying. He's using imagery from, from a natural occurrences, natural disasters, but he's really talking about forces of chaos and change in the world, especially the military might of Sennacherib and the swelling pride of the Assyrians. They had conquered nation after nation after nation, toppled God after God after God. So, the psalmist is describing uh, using natural imagery that everyone could understand to describe human behavior. And so if we need not fear when the earthquakes or mountains crumble or the stormy seas threaten to swallow us into the, the deep, why would we let the threats and fears of what might be Live in our heads rent-free. Don't let circumstances distract, distract you from trusting God above all else. We miss things when we're distracted. Oh, no, I, I see everything, I hear everything. No, we miss things when we are distracted, and we don't even realize it. Researchers at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington, conducted a research study back in 2009 about what we miss when we are distracted. They literally had a man dressed in a clown outfit, makeup, clothes, everything. They literally had a clown riding a unicycle in a busy square with people coming and going, and yet scores of people never saw the clown. Now why? Because they were distracted, either listening to music or talking to a friend, maybe talking on the cell phone or using their cell phone. Actually, the cell phone was the, <laughs> the greatest culprit of all. Most people who were on their cell phones never saw the clown. After passing through the square, hundreds of people were asked if they saw anything unusual when they walked through the square. And only 8% of the people on their cell phones said they saw something unusual. When they were asked the follow-up question, did you see the unicycling clown? Still, only 25% of those on their phones saw the clown. 
They were distracted. And so they missed what was right there in front of them. Don't let circumstances distract you from trusting God above all else. Because when we are distracted, we miss God. We miss the river of God's presence flowing through our lives as verse 4 describes. We can get so locked in on our threatening circumstances that we miss that God will help when morning dawns. We miss that when God raises his voice, the earth melts. We miss that he's wrought desolations in the earth. We miss that he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. When we are distracted, we miss God in that moment. Now listen, when we embrace God in his nearness, the threat of our circumstances diminishes. God is in the midst of her. The Lord of hosts is with us. That's the nearness of God. Those make me think of Paul's words in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Think about that phrase, the Lord of hosts. It's repeated twice in this song, by the way. It means that the Lord commands all of heaven's angel armies. He is the Lord of hosts. He commands all of heaven's angel armies. Well, how many angels might that be, preacher? We don't know how many angels there are. The Bible uses words like myriads and countless and thousands upon thousands to describe the angel scenes, all of which mean that there are too many to count. One little glimpse into what might be, angels are sometimes likened to the stars. Now, not that the stars are angels, that's not the point. Angels are sometimes likened to stars and there are, to our knowledge, octillions of those, but we don't know how many angels there are. We do know, though, that the Lord commands them all. And if one angel, if one angel can destroy 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night, don't you know that we are in safe hands with all the hosts of heaven? So trust God above all else. Don't let circumstances distract you from trusting God above all else. And here's how to do both. Be still and know that he is God. The New American Standard Bible that I preach from captures the essence of, of being still. Some of your translations say, be still and know that I am God. That being still, it's not to be still. Did you like that, by the way? Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not being physically still. What it means is to cease striving. In other words, just stop what you're doing. All your activity, all your striving, just, 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 just stop it. All, all of your attempts to fix things and all of your nervous pacing and all of your worrying and, and all of your meddling and God's business, just just. Top it. And then, and only then, will you see God at work. Being still starves our pride because it reminds us that we're not as important as we think we are. Being still moves us out of God's way. You know, we have a tendency to get in God's way. Being still moves us out of God's way. And being still allows us the opportunity to see God present in our present. It allows us to see him do his thing. Imagine the challenge of finding one solitary person in a packed football stadium. Or hearing one voice in a sea of sounds. How could you possibly do that? Well, for starters, you have to focus. 
And that's what some of us have lost in our relationship with God is our focus. We've got all of this noise, all of this movement. It takes focus. Be still and know that I am God. In closing, I want you to keep in mind that the ancient Hebrews sang this as a song of worship. The book of Psalms is the Hebrew hymn book. And so they sang Psalm 46 as a song of worship. What God had done in the past instructed them in their present because God does not change. The same God who was faithful to their forefathers was going to be faithful to them. That was their trust. That was their faith. And so let's join the ancient chorus and celebrate God as our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Let's celebrate the nearness of God, no matter the circumstances, because regardless of what our present looks like, God is there. He is present in our present. And as we saw last week, the nearness of God is our good. Let me invite you today to draw near to the Lord because he certainly has drawn near to us. Now that might mean for some, giving your heart to Christ, becoming a follower of Jesus. We'd love to talk more with you about what it means to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord, the Jesus who died on the cross, rose from the dead, to give your heart to him and become his disciple. Let's talk about that. Others of us, we've done that. And yet, sometimes we drift Or sometimes we're distracted. Sometimes we willingly choose to walk away. But today's a good time to come home. And so let me encourage you, wherever you are, with God, with your faith, with your understanding, with your belief, wherever you are with God, let me encourage you today to be still. And know that he is God. Preacher, you just don't understand what I'm going through right now. That's just it. That's that's what God wants you to, to know. Is that he is near. He is there. He is with you. Let him fight your battles. Now, this is not an excuse for us to sit down and just say, well, God will do it. I mean, obviously, sometimes God sends us to, you know, in to do spiritual warfare. But either way, he calls us to a life of faith, to trust in him. And so whether that faith that we're talking about today is a first-time faith, to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord, become a follower, a disciple of Jesus, or it is a renewed faith, a refreshed faith. Let's exercise faith today because only as we exercise faith can we please God. I'm going to pray when I say amen. We're going to sing a song. Pastors will be down front to receive you. And we'd love today to help you take your next step with God. Now, your next step may be something I haven't even talked about. We'll be ready to talk with you nonetheless. There's information on the screen where you can respond electronically. But if you're in the house today, then you have an opportunity to talk to a pastor now. And so let's pray. Gracious Father and the powerful, beautiful, majestic Name of Jesus, we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And let that be true in this place in these next few moments. Lord, as you're calling souls unto your heart to be saved, Lord God, may they have faith to believe. And Father, may may those of us who are born again, and yet, Lord, we're not where we ought to be with you, as we hear your voice, as we sense your spirit drawing us nearer to your heart, Lord, may we say yes. Or whatever it is that you're saying to our hearts today, help us, Lord, to respond in the affirmative. Lord, thank you that you are our God. And as our God, you are our refuge, our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Lord, we are grateful for your nearness. Lord, make yourself known and near in these next moments. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You come as God's Holy Spirit speaks. You come.